fun, fun little announcement. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Christy, and um, I'm the director for the Friends of Natars Bay Watershed Estuary Beach and Sea, which we affectionately abbreviate to WEBS. We're a small nonprofit that works to sustain the Natars Bay area, th area through stewardship um, and education. Uh, the way we do that is we, um, we uh, seek private donations as well as grant funds to um, create learning experiences for youth in pre-K through um, high school, as well as to offer a variety of programs to the public for free um, so that people can learn about the wonders of the Nitars Bay area and how to be good stewards of them. We also work really hard to partner with other agencies and community partners to, to, do, um, to bring community science opportunities to our area so that we can all learn um, about this place together and advance our understanding uh, scientifically together. Um, and, um, and this is one of the topics that we've been really in, interested in learning more about. And so we're really excited to have it here tonight. Um, I did want to uh, recognize our partners, Explore Nature Tillamook Coast, which is a partnership of eight different organizations like ours that works within Tillamook County to highlight the importance of the natural resources here, um, work do, that is being done to conserve and restore the natural resources, and also natural resource-based industries. Um, you can learn more about them at the website that you see on the screen, uh, exploreNatureTillamookCoast.com. And I also want to thank our um, partners at Shuck Portland, who have um, um, recruited us to be their charitable partner. And we've been honored that they've done that for the last few years. It's a group of business owners, chefs, um, seafood distributors that came together to um, try and highlight the importance of our wetlands, estuaries, and the importance of wild oysters in those systems. Um, so we want to thank them as well for what they have uh, contributed to our organization to help us bring things like this out to the public. Um, if you want to learn more about what we do, um, you can check out our website, netarsbaywebs.org. We are looking to get back to in-person events this month. And so we have things that we're working towards and looking forward to um, at the end of the month, exploring the beaches and the tide pools. Um, next month, um, exploring, you know, learning more about birds with Portland Audubon, um, exploring the salt marshes with our own biologist, Jim Young. Um, we're all working on the details of getting those things um, finalized and bringing the registration to you so that we can explore again in person, which is something we've been missing. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Paul and just wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, encourage you to learn a little bit more about us if you don't already know. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Hillary, Hillary Hayford with us this evening. She currently works uh, with the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, which she will talk about, but uh, has a really diverse background. She has been described as uh, someone, with an, someone who is an unceasing fanatic of coasts and tidelands. She has a long history of exploring the ecology of marine organisms living in those environments and has worked with a number of organizations in that, in that direction. She has a PhD in biology from the University of Washington and she is said to make a fierce cup of coffee, which I'm sure she's needed a lot in the last 18 months. So Hillary, with that brief introduction. Oops. Was I, I was muted. I Chrissy, was, was I muted through, through that? Okay. Oh, you muted me. Okay. All right. Are we there, folks? Great. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> um, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. This is an exciting moment for me to uh, get to learn about a new area and um, talk with new folks and also share with you some of what I've learned about Olympia oysters. Even though I've been working in marine systems for multiple decades, I'm relatively new to the oyster world. So I'm sure there will be all kinds of information that I can learn from you tonight in our discussion as well. This is me, uh, obviously still during COVID times, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what I look like not um, in such a small box talking at you. This is me in the field and you're welcome to contact me in the future if you have questions as well. 
Before I get started, I wanted to uh, have an acknowledgement with gratitude of the Coast Salish people, including especially the Suquamish and Duwamish who have stewarded since time immemorial the land and water where I live and work here in Seattle. And also the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Tillamook and the Silitz Mastuka who are stewards of the area close to your heart, Leech Hearts Bay. So in this talk, I'm gonna try and break it up into two sections so we have a chance to um, interact with one another at more than one occasion during um, the, the full time. So at first I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what our organization is, the basic biology and ecology of Olympia oysters and some of the considerations that, that we um, take into account when we're planning restoration projects, then we'll have some questions. And in the second part, tell you a little bit more about our overarching approach to restoration and walk through a couple different examples of projects so you can kind of get a few details uh, on how those might unfold. And I'll tell you right now that I'm, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about a whole lot of different things. So um, it, I will be excited for your questions. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> So Puget Sound Restoration Fund is almost uh, coming up on 25 years old. We're a nonprofit that now has 15 employees, but has was much smaller than that in the early years. We design, test, and spearhead in water work to restore Puget Sound marine habitat species and water for people and place. And that's the really important thing to us is to choose species that are both uh, huge contributors to healthy ecosystems and also uh, personally important to people and the people that are working um, around those species. So the way that our executive director Betsy Peabody puts it, we think about living resources that tie us to the way that people lived in the place in the past, something that can tie us to the future and a resource that can support us. So we choose our species as a way to tether ourselves to something real, a species that has shown resilience. So the particular goal um, with respect to habitat is to reestablish dense self-sustaining populations that provide ecosystem services, in, you know, including those services to humans. And what we term our habitat program the, the two programs that I work on are bulk help habitat and of course, Olympia oyster habitat. And so even though these are two wildly different species, they're ones that are close to people's heart that create a habitat for other species to live within uh, and that can dominate and really structure an entire ecosystem or sorry, community within an ecosystem. So I wanna introduce my close partners on our habitat team, as we call ourselves, and, and uh, there are little cutouts at the bottom here showing you what actual faces look like because we have been working with masks up until this past month. Um, so Brian Allen, Gray McKenna, and Tilly Smith, and the work that I'm presenting here is work that all of us have been um, conducting. Just to give you a sense of where we're at, I think everybody is probably pretty rooted in in the local geography, but in case anyone is not um, familiar with the Pacific Northwest, here is Nechartz Bay off on the coast of Oregon. And here is PSRF on Bainbridge Island, which is just outside of Seattle. And we consider uh, Puget Sound to be this area uh, down below here, but actually we do our work all the way up to the Canadian border in a place called Drayton Harbor up here. And the places where we're able to work with Olympia oysters are gonna be all of these little estuaries and bays and inlets down through Olympia and these little winding waterways that Olympia oysters love so much. But we also work with kelp in some of these bigger, faster moving waters that are in the general Puget Sound area. The Olympia oyster, the little muddy, unglamorous, beautiful, amazing invertebrate creature is the Olympia oyster. So you might 
disregard them if you see them on the shore. If you're taking your children to look at the intertidal, you're not probably targeting the Olympia oyster for its beautiful colors and spectacular shapes. This is one very important tiny animal that is not a traditional impressor for humans. Sort of a typical size is about two inches long. And after I put this photo together, I noticed that this is actually showing you two Olympia oysters. This is how they like to um, structure themselves and how they like to live. So there's the main shell. And then you see on the right hand side, there's this smaller shell where a younger oyster has glued itself onto the existing oyster and thereby they'll start to form the reef. Just for contrast, these are much smaller than the Pacific oysters, which are called Crestostria or Magellana gigas. This is the cultivated oyster that we're eating in, in most cases. And the native Olympia oyster, Austria lurida, is um, just a fraction of this size at full size. As far as we know, these two oysters can live side by side together. They have slightly different habitat requirements, but this is something that we're still exploring. So what happened um, to the Olympia oyster is that historically, its full range was from Sitka, Alaska down to Baja, Mexico. So covering the entire West Coast. But uh, through a few different things that I'll talk about in just a moment, the range has been reduced by 40%. And even though there are still Olympia oysters in 60% of that original range, there's now been a loss of abundance in almost all of the sites across the board. So there are very few places where you see as many of them as you might once have. So this historical decline in Puget Sound was due to several factors, but I suspect that these are similar to the factors for most of the historical Olympia decline um, throughout the West Coast. There was a harvest of Olympia oysters, uh, especially in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. Once those oysters uh, were harvested heavily, we needed to grow more oysters. And so those tidelands were in sometimes used for alternate uses like bringing in the Pacific oysters and keeping that oyster habitat going. So while the Pacifics didn't uh, specifically replace the Olympias, humans caused them to do so in a bunch of different cases where we put in a Pacifics and the Olympias couldn't come back on their own. But really the, the final punch on this story, especially in Puget Sound was we had a bunch of paper mills and pulp mills and the toxins that ran off of that were too much for these animals that are filter feeders and that are taking in water all of the time. And so the icing on the cake for us was really having these, uh, the, a high level of pollution and having that pollution grow over time. So this is what we term a reef, which is funny if you compare it to a coral reef, but this is what an Oli reef looks like. So down below, this is just piles of shells. Some of them are attached to one another in little clusters. Some of them are individual. They're mixed in with red algae and other types of species, also mixed in with rock and sand and mud. In this upper picture, I'm holding up what is a Pacific shell that has been used as a settlement substrate for these um, olies to grab onto. So all of these smaller round circles that are on here, and there are many of them, are Olympias. And when I say settlement, I mean grab on. <laughs> that when they are juveniles, they're in the water. And I'll talk just a little more about that in a minute. And then as adults, they need to hold on to something hard. So this oyster habitat or the habitat that the Olympia oysters create is a reef, but it doesn't look like the big hummocks that Pacific reefs can cause. And it doesn't look like a coral reef. It looks like this scrappy mix of clusters of oysters and some single oysters and other types of species put together too. This habitat's what we're going for. This is really important. And some of the cool features that it does, besides just having these oysters that we love, is that it, these oysters themselves directly supplement the food web. 
<laughs> so here's the obvious one that I'm sure you can picture, although these are not Olympia oysters that are open here. Some people like the Olympia taste, some people don't. It can tend to be a little bit metallic and they're certainly smaller than some of the other oysters, but, but humans do consume Olympias and that was how they were harvested at such high numbers in the first place. But there are many other species that consume these as well, including um, other species that we're quite familiar with and interact with a lot like Dungeness crab and oyster catchers. So directly feeding the um, food web is an important function of having those Olympias back. They also help to structure the beach. And so they can create a firmer habitat where if you had just gooey mucky mud, having some shell and reef start to form there, you begin to um, shift that from being just a sink where you can't really have any living organisms except those that live um, interstitially, like between the spaces in the mud. And, and you can start to have still gooey, uh, but just enough sort of a structure that, that all these other things that might be living on the surface in this background photo can start to come in as well. And so you can get a richer community overall. We also think that this is probably altering the way that sediment moves on the beach. And most Olympia oyster beaches have small seeps or even larger creek drainages and other important um, transport ways up into the um, onshore like terrestrial waterways. And so how that sediment moves around could have important implications. Besides just that sort of stabilizing those, the sediments themselves, it's providing these uh, shell reefs are providing a complex habitat that can support a diversity of species. And one that I wanna just highlight because this is touted as one of the huge benefits of having it be Olympia oysters are uh, these prey of salmon. So when I say that there are creeks and drainages that move up land, and um, down offshore that are crossing these oyster habitats, oftentimes those are salmon creeks or salmon drainages so that these fishes are swimming right over where the Olympia oyster reef would be. And this is just to show you a little bit of data. This is from a recent paper, not by um, Puget Sound Restoration Fund, but we did contribute some of our data to this analysis. And so what this is comparing here along the bottom x-axis, eelgrass, off-bottom oyster culture, on the bottom oyster culture like reefs, or bare mud. And what it's looking at is these different types of invertebrates. And the one to focus on are these Harpactocoida. This is a copepod, uh, a, a type of copepod that in, contains a bunch of different species. And a copepod is like a very small crustacean like a crab or a shrimp. And so these Harpactocoida are what baby salmon really like to eat. And having an increased number of that over your beaches, where you're going to have salmon swimming in and out of the stream, is seen as really desirable. And this uh, circle I've got highlighted here is just to show that this pink bar from bare mud to just having oyster culture on the bottom increases. There's a higher proportion of this desirable thing that we want to have. And then finally, of course, oysters are known for their fil filtration. So they're filtering water as they're um, bringing it across their gills to be able to pick the food out of the water. And they're uh, therefore uptaking nutrients and changing the nutrient cycle so that they're actually able to take nutrients from the water and um, redistribute it into the sediments that are around the oysters, making it both less nutrient polluted water and richer sediments. So oysters are really famous for up to 25 gallons a day is the party line that, that we can say, but we know that that can change depending on whether you're talking about Pacifics or Olympias and that the exact location of the population and how much water you have moving across it is also different. So we are still working. We don't know exactly how quickly the filtration of an Olympia oyster uh, goes and we're we uh, specifically PSRF, but also just in general, oyster biologists need to do more work to get this number ironed out so that we can tell you how much filtration benefit there is when restoring an area.
Okay. Couple things about these little guys biology. So this image is just talking about their life cycle. When they start to reproduce, they, the males will release the sperm. So into the water and it has to find a female that's nearby. So you can see that there's a clear benefit here of having a reasonable population size of a lot of Olympia oysters next to one another. If they're too far apart, this process of fertilization is probably not gonna happen. Kind of unusually for marine species, the oles will develop the larvae inside the shell in the mantle cavity of the female for one to two weeks. And so that this is to help them get a little bit of a head start. But at that point, they still do have a planktonic phase or that phase where they're in the water column, possibly offshore. This planktonic phase, again, can go for one week up to two months. And so you can really think about how much the spatial difference between when you've got a little cluster of Olympias that are reproducing and where a good place for Olympias to live, how far apart are those and how long will the babies be in the water before it gets to that next good spot? And so these uh, babies are called spat when they settle or recruit. There are lots of different words that mean approximately the same thing for this process of coming out of the water column, grabbing onto a good place to live and growing back up again. And this um, part where we have to have some of this working out well for oy adult oysters being nearby, some of it working out well for babies that are floating out in the water column, and then some of it working out well for babies that are spat that want to settle onto the rock. There's really three different phases of life that things could go wrong or that you wanna make sure that as much as possible is set up to go right for your oysters. Well, here's one of the things that can go wrong. This is a big oyster predator in some locations. So we have lots and lots of beaches that don't have any evidence of oyster drills which is this whelk snail pictured here. Primarily in Washington, we have Ocean Umbrellus inornatus, the Asian or Japanese drill, but there's also Eurosalpinx cinerea, an Eastern drill. These have both come in with imported oysters that we've cultivated in all sorts of places and are naturalized to many beaches, but not all. So I'm showing you this because here's evidence of drill predation. They lick their way in in these perfect little circles. So if you have this problem with your oysters, it's really easy to tell that that's the problem that you're having because it leaves behind this mark. Obviously at this site, we were having quite a problem with really high drill numbers. And that's one of the things we don't quite know how to tackle with oyster restoration yet. Like we're working on coming up with different strategies and taking the strategies we have and modifying them to be robust against predators, but we're not really sure how to do that. There's also a flatworm that makes a different type of drill hole that's supposed to be a, a little bit more like a keyhole. And I haven't seen that yet. So I haven't got a photo for you here, but we're on the lookout at one of our sites in particular. Okay, so what do these oles need? They need low pollution water, no paper mills, please. <laughs> And this is greatly handled through watershed actions, right? Political or um, grassroots efforts to keep areas clean, individual efforts, all of the work that your organization and others are doing to keep the watershed healthy are helping to meet this low pollution um, criterion. They need a suitable environment. So oftentimes we will go directly with our Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife records. They have all the historic oyster reserve areas. We know that those were once suitable environments and we can go out there and map different environmental characteristics and determine whether or not they still are suitable environments that we can start to do restoration work there. And I'll talk a little bit more about what environmental characteristics in the second part of the talk. They need substrate to settle on. So ideally, when you've got huge numbers that aren't, you know, it isn't that decrease of 90% of original abundance, they'll settle on adults. So you have babies that just grab onto the adult and you get those reef formations. But uh, as I think probably most of you are aware of, that's 
one of the things that's really lost when we've lost those adult oysters. And so adding substrate to sites that have now turned into mud flats is one of the big strategies I'll talk about. And then they need to have competition and predation kept in check. So there are lots of competitors and lots of predators that they can withstand, but there are a lot of complexities here. So for example, one of the things that Olympia oysters competes with that they actually outcompete is eelgrass. But eelgrass is one of the top loved, most important species in terms of um, fish nursery in bays and estuaries. And so even if Olympias can outcompete that, people don't want that competition to be set up. We need to try and find out how to preserve both of those different habitats. Predation, I showed you all of those deaths by drill, but there's a certain size where they're likely to be too large for the drill to get in unless the, the drill's population is just wildly out of hand. So predation wise, we might be able to work with that a little bit just by adjusting what size of oyster we're able to outplant. So these are kind of our four big things that we're thinking about in terms of getting the place and the resources just right for an ole to thrive. So there's three big actions that are big different approaches at this point that we are taking with modifications that we do or modifications possible within each of these. And the first one is singles, live oysters, like these little ones in my hand. We have our own hatchery right now um, in cooperation with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, and also um, funded through Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So PSRF runs a conservation hatchery where we rear both Olympia oysters and pinto abalone. And the thing about putting these singles out in the wild is that we're adding these individuals. We can adjust how large they are when we decide to outplant that and possibly increase their chance of surviving predators and competitors by getting them ahead of that baby stage before they go out. Also bonus, these can be harvestable for example, we can um, sell these or give these or work in cooperation with some of the commercial growers in our area to have Olympia oysters side by side with Pacific oysters in some of Washington's large shellfish farms. And the Nature Conservancy has a program called SOAR that's working uh, with those type of cooperations now. And we have two different proposals that are um, in consideration through that program. Okay, we can also, second one, do shell enhancement. So this is just adding that substrate. And here's an image of the mud flat, the pile of shell, and the shell spread over the mud flat. And this is Pacific shell, which is by far the most common substrate to add because we know that it works and it's available. So we'll add this shell near an existing population or near where we've measured that there actually is some, um, Ole larvae that's in that water column. There's a reason to believe they're out there. They just don't have any place hard to live. And the great thing about this is that it preserves the local genetics. So anytime we're growing up in the hatchery, no matter how careful we are, and we are, we do a lot of genetic testing and research, um, but no matter how careful we are, we're still having to make human guesses about what's best in terms of, of putting different gene types out into the wild. And so it's great if we can go with something that's already there if there is an existing resource. And this is just a close up image to show you on these big pieces of Pacific shell, these smaller round pieces again, are different size classes, different age classes of oles. So they'll grab on no problem to this shell if it's out there. And then the final major category of restoration action that we work with at this point is spat on shell enhancement. So again, these live baby oysters on the substrate. So we're putting the animal and the habitat it likes all out in one step. And this enables us to do stock rebuilding. It's a little bit less time and money intensive than singles and you can cover a large area with all of these different animals. 
But there are a lot of things to consider. So I'm just going to pause for a few seconds and be quiet and let you um, think about in your mind what different types of challenges you've encountered in thinking about oyster restoration or you could imagine comes up in thinking about that. And I'm gonna give you just a little flavor of the types of things. Logistical, even moving through the mud. One of our sites has mud up to my thigh. <laughs> I uh, have to crawl there sometimes. <laughs> it's very difficult to work in that type of habitat. We might need massive volumes of animals in order to get this uh, population jump started. Biological, I already talked a little bit about competition and, and predator considerations. Legal, there's a lot of different land use, including commercial use of land. And I wanna be really clear that we work very closely with commercial growers and support commercial growers. They are not in um, at all counter to the restoration actions and activities that we're trying to do, but it is land that is um, already dedicated to a certain use and we need to find better ways to integrate. And then in Washington in particular, we have really complex ownership of tidelands. So oftentimes we're restricted to working on a state owned parcel or a property owner who specifically wants to donate their land to this effort. And then of course, there are always ethical considerations, prioritizing uh, between communities and regions who gets served by having oysters come back to their area. And how do we prioritize things like um, eelgrass versus Olympias that both need our help. So lots of things here. And you'll notice I skip over the big one, money. I mean, you brought up money here, and I'm sure that's on everybody's mind as well. Coming up with the funds can be quite complex. So with that, um, I'd like to take the first pause and go ahead and, and talk a little bit if anybody has some questions that I can try and address on this part of the talk. Thanks, Hillary. Um, our volunteer Shelly's um, gonna man the chat in um, our Zoom meeting and I'm gonna migrate over to Facebook Live and make sure there's no, no questions there. Um, thanks for going over all the kind of things to consider and um, highlighting some of these things. I'm already percolating with ideas, so. Great, thanks, Christy. So did you see the uh, question from uh, Michael and Kathy? Uh, um, Hillary, one question was, uh, my understanding is that despite its name, black oyster catchers rarely eat oysters, preferring mussels, whelks, and limpets. Do you have more information on that? Is it partly a function of there being relatively few Olympic oysters? That's a great question. I don't have more information, except I agree. Uh, oyster catchers are really big consumers of limpets, which I used to study the, the limpet end of things uh, and also mussels. But I am totally uncertain if that is because the Olympia oyster are not that available or that abundant, or if that's more of just a misnomer to get go. That, that's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Another was, uh, how long is the life cycle of the Olympiads? Back to mature and mature until when? Yeah, so um, from spat, they can usually start reproducing when they're only a year or two old. So they they become reproductive relatively quickly. And um, that you can see them grow like a very, very old, very large Olympia oyster might be, you know, four or five or six centimeters in length across. And that animal is going to be more than 10 years old, but oftentimes we see them probably more in the five to 10 year range. Okay, thanks. 
Did we ask the question, what impact do events like the recent heat dome have? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> so that's a great question. And the, the answer is we don't entirely know, but I can assure you that I would have received several emails from researchers from California through Canada asking this question that are going out to collect data this week because they're really concerned. So one good thing that's in the Olympia oyster's favor, especially compared to some other species like Pacific oyster, is that Olympias can take, have a very high heat tolerance and a high tolerance for low salinity. So they're actually pretty resilient. Um, I, there's a third part too, I should add, they have a higher tolerance for low pH. So they're pretty resilient animals in most likely because they evolved in these habitats. These, you know, west coast bays and estuaries have wildly shifting of all of those environmental conditions. And um, we're worried about them with that heat and that heat was exceptional. The one site that we've been to so far to revisit where we had introduced oysters, there wasn't evidence of mortality fortunately, but I believe that was on Tuesday um, that my coworker was able to check. And so we may see some residual mortality over the next week. If say the heat itself didn't cook animals, but just caused a huge amount of tissue damage that they now um, don't have enough food resources to spend the time repairing. So we'll have to see. It's a very uh, sad and interesting question but we have reason to be hopeful that the Olympias might do okay or better than some unfortunate species. Great, thank you. Here's another question. Is there a commercial pressure on Oles despite their small numbers? Um, there is not in Washington at this point and I can't speak to it more broadly than that. The, I, I believe that if anything right now, so there's there's no take of Oli's in any large amount of the natural populations. And I believe right now that we're really encouraging there to be a little bit of commercial pressure because if there was a little bit more of community interest in um, purchasing those animals and consuming those animals, we may be able to do some more collaborative projects with the farms in terms of growing some for harvest and some for restoration. And we do also have some of those some for harvest, some for restoration projects um, proposed with some of our, the local tribes to our area. Great, thank Hillary, you. Hillary, I had one for Facebook. Um, they were curious about Oli presence or Olympia oyster presence in Etars Bay and um, if you're not familiar, I can can help with that one. Yes, please. <laughs> I know that there are residual populations and I know that there have been past efforts to um, restore and that likely those residual populations are tied to those initial efforts, but please tell me more. Yes, absolutely. So there were, um, so the, the oysters in Nitars Bay were harvested and were considered to be functionally extinct. Um, sometime in the 1970s, um, but there were two efforts to restore them, one in the 1990s by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, where they relocated oysters, I believe from Washington, um, to the Bay, and then later, starting in 2005 with the Nature Conservancy, who, who over a series of years planted 80 million um, uh, native oysters set on Pacific shell in the Tarts Bay. They haven't been monitored since 2015, so we're not really sure what the current population is, but um, our kind of non-scientific evaluation suggests that they aren't as strong as they were in 2015. So, all right, let me see. I think there's one other question here. You kind of said it, but there are, there are actually farms selling, uh, native oysters from Washington, right? Um, yes, I believe so. Although uh, I'm thinking most recently I visited Taylor Shellfish in April and they were growing some but not selling them because the taste in that particular location wasn't desirable. 
but I believe that there are probably some smaller farms um, and particularly smaller family farms. Taylor is, and then Penn Cove are our massive shellfish organizations. And I don't think either of those growers is selling them right now. I have Hillary one more. Okay, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Shelly. Oh, I had, a, I had a question, Hillary. I wondered, have you eaten the Oles? And if you have, how do you compare them to our Pacific oysters? I have, um, and actually I tried one when I was just telling you that Taylor wasn't selling from their stock, but they still let me try one <laughs> from that particular area. And so that, you know, that was a little bit different from some of the others I've tried. In general, they're a little bit less of that creamy, briny, creamy flavor, and a little bit more mineral or you know, that slight metallic bitterness that sometimes oysters can have, they seem to be a little bit stronger in that. And what I've heard is that, you know, that one I had most recently was more on that end. And then also um, there is a subset of people that prefer that greatly and that are really looking for the Oli's. That's the flavor that they like as well. So there's some personal preference as with fine wines <laughs> between the different oyster species. The last question, and then we're letting you move on, Hillary, is um, what time of year do oles usually um, spawn and then release larval oysters? Yes, great question. I was realizing I didn't, I didn't, I hurried past this information. I didn't go into this. Um, this varies depending on where you are on the coast. So I'm not certain for your slightly different um, latitude in knee charts and then also for the fact that you're on the outer coast and not in the inland waters if the timing would be exactly the same. For us they're releasing larvae in the early spring and we see the settlement um, primarily in May, June, July. So we put out our settlement collectors between May and August and we really expect that they're probably the height of it is late June to early July. So today would have been good. This is another thing to go back to the climate change. Sorry, it was in my mind a climate change and also just this specific heat wave question, which is we don't know if having that heat wave during the juvenile release time and the larvae time will have a lasting impact, but there's a good chance that we will be seeing an effect like that. It will be difficult to tie specifically to the heat dome, but is likely related. So we'll be looking for evidence of that as well. Great, thank you. Great questions. So in the second part of this talk, I wanted to tell you a few more, um, a couple of case studies really of, of places that we've done but also talk about one of the things that PSRF has been successful about, and I can't take credit for this because I am only a little over a year in, but they set really big goals and then we find out how to clamber to them. And it's very attractive if you uh, want to learn how to do that like I do. So one of these really big goals was to restore a hundred acres of Oli habitat in 10 years. And when this goal set out, I believe that we had only a couple hundred acres, maybe 300 acres of Oli habitat throughout all of Puget Sound that was exit, you know, going strong, healthy reef. And so this was adding considerably 25 to 50% to what was already existing. So to picture 100 acres, if you took these little two inch oysters and sorry, and stacked them up on one another end over end, you could actually draw a line all the way from Baja to the very tip of Alaska here. So a hundred acres when spread out covers a whole lot of area. And as I've already mentioned, we did all of this work um, in the greater Puget Sound region or the US part of the Salish Sea. This was made up through 28 different projects with each site being unique. And the only thing I'm hoping that you can notice from, I'll flip through a couple of these, is the different project areas, which are these colored patches. So every site that we have has a unique 
shape, a unique place that maybe oysters will go, a unique set of strategies. And this is what I think the recipe for success is. And I say I think because I actually consulted our executive director and my counterpart, our restoration director, to see what they have found to be the success over the last 15 years that they've been working together um, specifically on Olympia oyster restoration. So number one, build a collaborative group. And who we work with is everyone we can find. And it sounds like you're doing very much the same thing with your organization. Certainly with tribes, with agencies, meaning state and federal and local, with academia, we're lucky to have several universities in our area, with industry, primarily commercial oyster industry, but others as well, and with individuals, individuals in the community, individuals who own tidelands, individuals who want to donate boat time, <laughs> all those different groups bringing them together. And so what this, my counterpart, Brian, the, our restoration director said was the, to be the glue that is bringing all the other actors together where we can sit together, think about, talk about, and dream about. And he just trailed off, got this big look on his face <laughs> on the dream about part. So that is the recipe for success. You must have all those ingredients in order to move forward effectively. And uh, Puget Sound Restoration Fund, this is a probably incomplete list of our partners and supporters. So we have been trying to keep in contact with all of the critical people that we can meet or find in our area. And we have monthly meetings with NOAA. We have monthly meetings with um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have regular contact with our Department of Natural Resources. We have regular contact with a variety of different university researchers and the um, natural resource departments of all of these tribes that are in our area. So I'm gonna leave that one in bold because this we highlighted across the board that that seems to be our biggest secret for success. The next though is to learn about the place. So each place is unique and therefore each project is unique. And this is, a really cool thing about what you're doing or, or um, considering to doing in niche hearts is, is really taking your one unique place and finding out what the right solution for that will be. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit here about the types of things that we learn about in place. Starting with some modeling mapping that happens behind the scenes before we're even in the field. And I should, I should also note that this list is a little bit on the sciencey end. There's a lot about place that we learn first, um, his historical uses, who are the people in the area that are impacted, all of that. So I'm just kind of starting this list at the what science do we do? So this habitat suitability index, the idea here is that you've got a model where you can calculate out and create a map based on whatever the inputs are. And um, former graduate student now has her master's degree, Charlotte Dorn from the University of Washington put together a habitat suitability index for Olympia oysters, taking all kinds of public data available from the state, things such as tidal elevation, temperature, salinity, currents, or even water residence time, how long it's hanging out in a certain area. And this is just kind of a summation. She ended up taking several more factors than this into account. And she created a score from zero to problematic to one green here, oyster heaven, or the places where if you were thinking about all these environmental factors, you would expect Olympia oysters to be living. And when she was first developing this, she compared the um, HSI score that she would get to where we actually saw populations of Oles doing well in the wild as a way to ground truth her model. But this one here is modeled for um, one of our water bodies. And you can see that some areas might be okay for Olympia oysters, 
the middle of the channel, it's just too deep. This is subtitle boating area. We wouldn't expect it. And then all of these basically surrounding the entire bay, there's at least a small layer of yellow or green or this pretty good habitat where maybe we should be seeing Olympia oysters. So then we go in the field and check it out. And this was one of our interns last year, Jacqueline Garcia, who is at Quilcene Bay taking notes on where are the existing species? Do we have any oysters, Olympia or Pacific? So you can see she's standing in, there's a naturalized population of Pacific oysters here. Is there eel grass? Are these other species there? This is Gray McKenna, who I already introduced. Gray is doing a tidal elevation survey using um, surveyor's equipment. So we'll go to the site and we'll try and map out the whole region so that we can understand what those elevations are. We do record temperature and salinity and we have different ways of accounting for the type and firmness of the sediment, mapping where there's freshwater input, trying to find existing information on how much flow is coming out of those freshwater channels at different times of the year. And then we want to see, are there already oysters there that are, uh, sorry, Olympia oyster there um, specifically. So here is Tilly and Brian over a quadrat, this PVC square here, that we're using to get a density per meter squared of how many oysters might be. And this particular place where they are now, they're actually looking at a place that has both Olympia and Pacific oysters. And so they're having to pick up each piece of shell and examine the little babies to identify which species they are. When they find one, they um, also will record the size. So that's what this background graph is showing here, the size class of the length of the Olympia oyster and the frequency or how many times each of those sizes is occurring. And I don't think it's, um, it's not too interesting to think about these different colors here, but for our project area, we have things that are like a reference population outside where the project is working. But the main thing to see is that in this particular site, there are just a few of those small oysters, but kind of a lot of the pretty large ones. And we know these pretty large ones are probably 10 years old or older. And so, while there's a population going here, there might not be any babies that are coming in, or there might be some. So we have a different technique for looking at the babies coming in. This is looking at that juvenile recruitment or settlement onto substrate. And so each one of these is a stack. We call these shell stacks or various other misnomers. <laughs> this is a wooden dowel with uh, 10 that we will measure and an 11th just to be in the mud Pacific oyster shells that have been drilled in the center. And so this constitutes one recruitment station. So as I mentioned, we put these out in May and collect them in August and we'll one station will have these three different sticks. And we try to put these out at the right tidal elevation, which in our area for our tides, the right elevation for Olympia oysters is about plus one foot above mean lower low water to minus two feet below. And these we try and put at about minus one foot to zero. So right in the middle of that range. And then when we bring them back in August, we'll look at each shell under the microscope to see how many babies have settled. And we this year with our partners, I think did this, I can't remember the exact number, but more than 40 sites 40 different sites throughout the Puget Sound area. So as we continue to go with this, trying to build up our data set, we can start to understand things about how dynamic is the recruitment each year anyhow. You can have a site that does really well every year for four years, year five, nobody shows up. Um, or you can have sites that almost never have any oysters and then out of the blue will show a big spike. And that's probably some oceanographic conditions but this would be another way to try and think about the heat dome and any impacts we might have on that. We have data from a lot of our sites for the last five years. So if we see a big change across the board this year, we'd know that it was something larger than just one little side effect. So we are working on a systematic approach, um, developing one that we both can use and share. And when I say systematic, 
we do all these certain things, but we don't have protocols written out for it. And we don't have decision trees. So if there are a lot of oysters coming in, that's a good sign. But what exactly does that mean? We don't have that laid out. So we have had a project going called the assessment pathway, where we want to try and lay out how we do our research and select our sites, how we choose and perform those restoration actions or modifications of them, and then assess what the success or failure of that restoration is into the future so that we can modify and make changes. And so we're actively working on this right now. We have some funding from uh, a local group in the Hood Canal and some project partners to try and get us a little bit further towards being able to uh, produce this manual, which then hopefully we can share with others. Don't hold your breath. That's certainly the plan, but it may not happen immediately. So in the meanwhile, um, and I've heard Christy mention this, I would just recommend for anyone who wasn't aware that checking in with the Native Olympia Oyster Collaborative is a really good way to get information about different restoration actions and, and specific metrics for what to be looking for or at your site and with your population. All right. Finally, our third, third piece of our recipe is then to try and match the need of that place to the funding and to the restoration actions. And uh, I say this as though it's just one process. Oh, you take this and then you match it to that. And of course, it's, there's a lot more um, intricate stuff going on there in terms of decision making being the right place at the right time. And this is really about opportunity finding the right opportunity at the time for your place and waiting for that moment when you can jump at a good funding source that's going to fit your needs exactly perfectly. It's a little bit of hand waving and it feels a lot like magic. And PSRF has become very good at this over the years. So I'm gonna try and give a couple examples of projects that we've done that maybe give you a, a more concrete sense. So our first case, a place called Dogfish Bay. Nice big, this is at low tide. You can swim or boat across here at high tide. So it's one of these where it's clearly has a, a dynamic relationship with the water. Dogfish Bay was on our habitat suitability index. It is great habitat, look at this. This is oyster heaven throughout almost all of this whole area. And the arrow is basically pointing to that place where this photo was taken. So that's right here in the middle. We would expect this would be a good place for Olympia oysters. So in the earlier days of PSRF, beginning in 2007, oyster enhancements were done, adding shell to Dogfish Bay because there was a little bit of existing population here. There was more added in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013, and finally in 2017. So this just shows the first few of those patches of where different shell enhancements were put together in different places that were adjacent year after year after year. And each of these projects was a, a small to medium sized project that came together with different funding through the Nature Conservancy, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, Environmental Protection Agency, um, the, the USDA. Funny, I'm realizing I don't know the acronym, <laughs> the full name of USDA. Oh, we'll have to learn. Um, and so all of each of these different projects, you know, starting with something that's a quarter of an acre to larger than that, patched together to create 10 acres over 10 years of repeated working in this same location. So in 2017, at the end of all of this, they went out and did a survey and found that there were 163 oysters per square meter or 6 million living oysters over the eight of those 10 acres that were surveyed. So in this area, there was a notable 
improvement in oysters, but it took repeated adding time and time again to get that number up. This is now a self-sustaining population. We went back last summer and there are oysters all over the place. The water's much cleaner. It's been really effective at filtering this area because they have 6 million oysters now. And this is one of our poster child's children uh, for how, what success might look like if your oyster restoration project really takes off. And this is a quarter meter square quadrat, it's not a full meter. And these little white circles are just me circling only in this bottom section where all of the little Olympias are. So we would expect that if it's 163 oysters per meter squared, there'd be about 40 in this little area. And we can see that it's well on the way to that number. I know you can't see that well through these circles, but I just wanna highlight that these, again, this is Pacific shell that's been added with these um, smaller animals that are attached onto that. So I bring up this case in particular of Dogfish Bay, not just because it's one of our poster children, <laughs> I, can, I can pluralize, uh, for restoration success, but also because it was iterative and because it happened in an earlier time point in PSRF before we started doing massive projects. So all of these different um, map, areas that uh, where projects were you know adjacent to one another and as I've said this doesn't show even the full year of all of the actions were working towards one long-term goal even though it could only be a smaller patch added at each given time and a smaller patch funded at each given time and I think there's potential that that might be a good model for your bay especially if you're um, if you know you've had some success in the past and you want to grow on that. This is a little bit different from our second case, which is our most recent project. And the only project that I personally have participated in in um, the 15 months that I've worked with Puget Sound Restoration Fund. So this project took place in Liberty Bay or Teth Alagua. This is located um, in another part of the same water body, actually. So I'll show you here, the HSCI, HSI score here is not as high, although it's still in the super great region, but mostly there's a really large area. So we have the potential if we worked over a really large area to make a really large impact. So we planned, and this was the final, um, acreage added to that 100 year, 100 acre, sorry, 10 year, 100 acre goal. We planned a 15 acre enhancement last October for uh, this chunk of Liberty Bay. Liberty Bay is right uh, near the town of Paulsbo and in the territory of the Suquamish tribe. Some of the people, of course, live in Paulsbo also. And this is expansive mud flat with low shell. So this is mostly mussel shell and gravel in kind of the high zone where I'm standing. But down below that plus one foot tide where uh, Olympias would be happy, you can see mostly it's just water over across mud. But actually this graph that I had shown you of um, distribution shows that there are quite a number of Olympias existing there. And if we added these up, some of these are at 25, we have hundreds of oysters in this bay. And what's more, we've been seeing at least some come in on those recruitment collectors year after year. So this is a good case for doing a shell enhancement where the resource, the animal is already there, but it needs some place to live across that soft area. And again, this is a giant pile of Pacific shell. So we get this shell, we purchased this shell from commercial growers. Oftentimes it has been seasoned for up to 40 years. <laughs> that means sitting in a pile like this on land after it had been pulled out of their um, farm. And so typically I would say we get ours anything from 10 to 40 years old. I think this particular pile was from the 80s. And one of the reasons we knew that was just it had some remnant 
farm e equipment buried in the shell. But one of the things that seasoning does here is that it's going to eliminate marine species. Now it's, you know, if there are, if there are species that are both marine and aerial or terrestrial, I'm thinking bacteria or something, there, I can't promise you that this is sterile, but there aren't any living marine invertebrates in this pile after it's been sitting on land for 10 years. They probably aren't gonna be there after it's been sitting on land for a week or three days. So this is one of the ways that we are trying to ensure that the product that we put back in the water is clean and ready to go. Washington doesn't have a shell recycling program with the local restaurants because we're specifically worried about oyster disease. So we have to use this older shell. In fact, we used a lot of it. You can probably get a sense from this image. We put 1500 cubic yards of this specific oyster shell into Liberty Bay. And so this is the barge coming into the bay and you can see on the bow of this thing, there are a couple of you know, large grown people <laughs> that look small compared to this massive pile of shell. And this barge is actually moving in here over only about six feet of water. So it was pretty incredible maneuverability and really tightly timed with the tides to be able to do a project of this size. And the way that we get that shell off, um, we'll see if this runs. I hear it might be a little bit uh, patchy or stop and start. We have a giant fire hose that just sprays that shell right off the side of the barge as it slowly paints over the project area of the mudflat. And I'll show you from on the barge here is our executive director manning that pump and hose as she moves that shell into the water. And we're trying for a nice even covering, but it ends up also being um, quite patchy. And that edge shape around the patches is something that our Department of Fish and Wildlife really likes to see in terms of habitat provided for other organisms. So this is a massive project. We're talking about almost a quarter of a million dollars for a 15 acre project of this scale. It's, it was huge. It was the largest project we've ever done. It was about 70% um, funded through USDA. And then we also had several private fundraiser activities and fundraisers within our organization. And this is a, a, an example of the before with the smooth mud flats and the after where there's shell and contour. And you can really see that there's some different type of texture going on. Uh, Obviously, there's a little more water covering this. It's a little higher tide in this after image. I <laughs> took much better after images in May when we went back, and then I promptly fell off the boat with my phone in the pocket, so I don't have those <laughs> for you today, and I don't have that phone either. <laughs> so Betsy had this advice to, to offer, or, or this commentary to offer, uh, to all of you in thinking about potentially restoring Olympia oysters in knee tarts. The most wonderful thing about being where the, they are, where you are, is embarking on a journey without knowing how it's going to go or where it's going to go. Putting a line in the sand and saying, I'm committed to this place. I'm going to embark and try to engage as many people as possible that we can do this effectively so that our human species can continue to survive here in the centuries to come. What a rich experience it's been. And I just wanted to end the part where I talk to you with that because I find it really inspirational, but I'm very happy to answer more questions. That was a lovely quote. <laughs> I got to meet Betsy a couple times, so that was good to see that. You can feel it. <laughs> it's infectious <laughs> from her. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, well, we definitely invite you to write your comments in the um, chat box, or if you're watching from Facebook Live, feel free. We're still watching there too. Um, the Facebook Live is a little bit delayed from us, so they actually just got to the part where you're asking for questions. Um, and so feel free to um, type those into um, the, the comment field in Facebook Live, and we will feed those to our presenter.
too. I'm curious about, um, you know, one thing that we talked about in, in need tarts is, uh, is re retention, um, you know, kind of the flushing rate of knee tarts bay. Um, what, do you have anything there where you've tried something and you've noticed that this area just flushes so rapidly that it just, even though maybe some, maybe that comes out in your, your index rating that you talk about, um, our bay just empties really quickly. Um, and so I'm curious if you've run into anything like that or know of anything like that. Very interesting question. The, we think, we think that this is a really important factor and we talk about it a lot in terms of residence time or how long the water will actually sit in the bay. And what we generally look for is kind of a high residence time because we want that water to stick around long enough that the potentially those babies of the Olympia oysters will be entrained in that bay and won't go anywhere. And it is sort of accounted for in our habitat suitability index, except for that the data for this is not very widely available. So the scale that the oceanographers in our area are working at is several miles or maybe even tens of miles at a time. So it's not fine scale enough to tell us the difference between one part of the bay and the other or two, the difference between two bays that are adjacent along the coast. So one way that people approach this, sometimes researchers will go out and do different dye studies in the water or some other type of marker to see how long things stay. We try and find whatever available information we have and then pick the place within that bay that has the, the higher residence time in general. However, <laughs> there are a few ways to think about this and the way that Olympias get there is not necessarily always one patch staying in its own home area, having those babies come back time and time again. And so it's possible that the reason um, that Olis were historically in knee tarts is that they were coming from another source population. Like one of your nearby bays might have been producing enough and that the water gets washed into knee tarts and it's never going to have that kind of self-sustaining population, but having the right habitat there would attract from other nearby populations. And that is something that we've seen in some of our areas, but can't quite figure out how to approach restoration wise, other than we're just working in a bunch of places to up the overall number of babies that are in, in the Puget Sound in the hopes that they'll kind of go from these source sites to these sink sites and, and populate more areas. I'll just add that there's also a recent paper in Yakina Bay from last year, I think, that was specifically looking at how if you could map that out from along the bay, you could target the most effective places to put your money, <laughs> basically. So, you know, if there if there is an area that's gonna be the most likely to be successful for restoration within your bay, um, this might be one way to approach it. And I can forward that to you if you're interested. Hillary, I think you might have addressed this bit in Dogfish Bay where you, you felt was very successful. Did you, uh, did you plant uh, oysters or was that natural recruitment? Yeah, um, great question. Oftentimes it was, primarily shell enhancement, but I think that at least two of those projects were spat on shell. And I think, I have to admit, I think I skipped over it because I realized I didn't know exactly how many projects were each type, but each type of project happened there. So it was a combo of making sure there was a little bit to get going, but primarily that place became natural recruitment. Okay, thanks. Christy, I, I don't know if you've seen the question here in the chat, but this is from the crawls to you. Are there plans for further restoration in New Tarts Bay? Thanks, Shelley. Um, yeah, so we what well, our group had just started talking about um, what it would take to revive the Nature Conservancy's efforts to um, 
do restoration of uh, native oysters in knee tarts uh, before the pandemic hit. And we had sat down and, and chatted with Dick Vandershaft, who led the project up um, in knee tarts. And we were talking with various different um, farmers and trying to make a plan. And so um, that when Hillary's talking about us considering um, things for knee tarts, that's where it's coming from is that we had we had started to sit down and really kind of think about how could we support native oyster restoration to continue in Knee Tarts Bay. Um, so there are no firm plans, but there is interest in helping make sure or helping to kind of maybe restart some native oyster restoration here. And sorry for any assumptions on my part there. I was trying to convey the um, let's let's go with Betsy's enthusiasm and say everybody wants oyster restoration. <laughs> No, you did not assume wrong. And yes, we love oyster restoration. <laughs> and I would love that paper. I would be very interested in seeing that paper. Great. That you mentioned. Uh, any more questions for Hillary? Um, well, assuming not, Hillary, you know, you're 170 miles away, you can't hear it, but there's a, a roar of applause for, from folks down here in the in Oregon. So that was a um, fabulous uh, presentation. And like like I said before, I, uh, it, I hope it may uh, spark us into actually getting back in gear on this in, in DTARTS. Well, I, I wish you luck and I'm so glad again um, to be here. Thank you for contacting us because any way that we can share what we've learned over those 25 years is for the good of you know all of our coastal regions and um, all of our Olympia oyster habitat. So we've got some lessons that are canned and ready to be passed on and many that are just um, buried in somebody's head <laughs> and we're working on we're working on moving forward so that we have both of those available but in the meanwhile please feel free to talk to us when when your questions arise well we know you're really busy I and mean, we really appreciate you making the time for us um, uh, yeah I, I echo that and um, so many things I was curious about you answered so I really appreciate what you put together Thanks, um, I'm glad. <laughs> I did, while we have you all, I just wanted to mention that uh, we are kind of slowly getting back to our public programs at, at NITAR's webs. And uh, Christina, do we, do we in fact have tide pool days coming up in uh, later in July? Yeah, we have tide pool days on the agenda. We're trying to firm it up with state parks and make sure we're all set from a state park perspective. But we're hoping to um, take some smaller groups, so a little different than in years past, where we kind of are, you know, opening it up and have a free for all for people to come out and explore with us. Um, we are welcoming small groups on the 22nd, 23rd, and um, 24th during our low tide series that's coming up in July. And so as soon as we get the approval from state parks, then we'll put the registration up and everybody can join us. Um, additional to that, we have um, uh, Jim Young, our local biologist's uh, yearly salt marsh tour coming up in August. And we also have a, um, a new birding on the bay um, event. We do birding on the bay every year, but we're doing a different format this year with Audubon Portland coming up on August 28th. So those are some things just to kind of to, to look forward to um, as we as we learn together. And two others I'd mentioned, uh, we're we're hoping to have a presentation on uh, the harbor seals in Guitar Bay on July 27th. Our our presenter is a little bit iffy, but we're hoping for that. And the uh, we're gonna resume having our uh, kayak tours uh, on September 11th. So. Uh, Look, if you're interested in those, uh, look at our Facebook page or website to uh, for more information on those. So with that, Hillary, thanks again. Really great. And uh, it'd be really nice to see you out on some mud flats sometime too. Oh, I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. And I will be spotting for you from here on out. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.